This is the final go now. Go pull for flight three of Starship. Anybody two? Go. Stage one? Go. Stage two? Go. Flight directors, go for push. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to stay connected, let us know what you'd like, and support us on Patreon. We appreciate you. I am extremely worried about America's future in space. While NASA is still capable of amazing feats of engineering science, it is led by politicians, like this man. This is Mr. Bill Nelson, the current NASA administrator. Mr. Nelson did fly in space, like Senators Jake Garn and John Glenn. He was a payload specialist on board Columbia for STS-61C, which was in orbit from January 12 to 18, 1986. This was the last flight prior to the Challenger disaster, which happened just 10 days after Nelson's mission ended. But unlike Garn and Glenn, who were both pilots with science backgrounds, Mr. Nelson's degree is in political science. Mr. Nelson was recently being questioned by a congressman named David Trone about China's ambitions in space. Now, I don't expect too much from politicians, and they rarely prove me wrong in that assessment. But I do expect the leader of America's space program to know a little bit about the subject. Sadly, when Mr. Trone asked, why do you think the Chinese are trying to get at, at the backside of the moon, Mr. Nelson said, they are going to have a lander on the far side of the moon, which is the side which is always in the dark. Uh, we're not planning to go there. When asked why not, Mr. Nelson said, we don't know what's on the back side of the moon, so uh, that would be something that they would discover. Trying to get at what the Chinese are doing, you think, on the back side of the moon. Do you have any insights well, in that? They are going to have a lander on the far side of the moon, which is the side that's always in dark. Uh, we're not planning to go there. And why not? And what's the benefit of doing so? We don't know what's on the back side of the moon, so... Uh, that would be something that they would discover. I am sure that most of you know this statement is fundamentally wrong on many levels, which makes you more scientifically qualified to be NASA administrator than Mr. Nelson. Political appointees do not get their positions by merit. They get them because of who they know. That doesn't mean they can't do a good job. I was worried about Bridenstine, and he turned out to be great. And while I'm sure that Mr. Nelson has tremendous leadership skills, he lacks a fundamental knowledge of space science necessary to make good decisions about moon exploration. Let's review a few things. There is no dark side of the moon, Pink Floyd notwithstanding. The moon is in tidal lock with the Earth, meaning that it rotates just enough to keep one side always facing Earth. So while the moon does have a near side and a far side, Every part of the moon gets 14 days of sunlight and 14 days of darkness. Except for the deep craters at the north and south poles, like Shackleton Crater seen here. These stay in perpetual darkness, and are a good location to look for water ice. Another exception is the crater rim here, or any sufficiently elevated location at the poles, which could be in perpetual sunlight. That's why I think the first human colonies on the moon should be here, at Shackleton, with solar panels along the rim providing continuous power and habitats dug out of the ice-filled regolith down in the crater, providing radiation shielding. We also do indeed know what the far side of the moon looks like. The first images of the far side came to Earth from a Soviet probe back in 1959, and NASA's own Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, is still mapping the entire moon in real time, and has been for the last almost 15 years. How could he not know this? 
Trone went on to ask Nelson why he thought the Chinese made the decision to go to the far side, to which Nelson replied, I have no idea. I would strongly suggest that Mr. Nelson educate himself on these matters, because I can promise you, the head of China's space program knows exactly why they are there. China has been making rapid progress in manned spaceflight with its orbital space stations, and they have announced that they plan to build a base on the moon. This will be called the International Lunar Research Station. And Russia has joined China to make this happen. The base will be a permanent scientific outpost. And the rovers landed so far are part of China's reconnaissance phase of this operation. Phase 1 started with the lunar orbiters Chang'e 1 in 2007 and Chang'e 2 in 2010. For Phase 2, Chang'e 3 soft-landed and deployed a rover on the near side in 2013. And then Chang'e 4 landed on the far side of the moon in January 2019. The far side of the moon has many advantages over the near side. It is away from prying eyes and is protected from Earth's radio noise and a much better location for radio astronomy. On the other hand, you need to place a relay satellite out here at the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2 where it will maintain a near rectilinear halo orbit, able to see both the far side of the moon and the Earth at the same time. Phase 3 involved a lunar sample return mission, which was completed by Chang'e 5 in 2020, returning 1.7 kilograms of regolith from Oceanus Procellarum, near Mons Runke. Chang'e 6 is expected to launch in May of this year, and will return samples from the edge of the Apollo Basin. So while the administrator of America's space program is still trying to catch up with his high school science classes, China is getting ready to go to phase four, which is the beginning of construction of the International Lunar Research Station. I don't want to say that things are dire for the United States and Europe, but it does not look good. Even Russia crashing their Luna 25 moon lander is meaningless in the light of China's successes. And Turkey has just announced that it is joining with China and Russia in the establishment of this first human outpost on the moon. Americans like to look back at our past success in the space race with the Soviet Union as absolute proof of our superiority. But the truth is, we got lucky. Their greatest engineer died during surgery. Then politicians got involved and the Soviet lunar program fell apart. We should not bet on that kind of luck to strike twice. Other nations signing on to help China include South Africa, Pakistan, and Egypt, as well as seven smaller nations. The scientific objectives of this Chinese-controlled international base are laudable, but make no mistake. China's plans to build this base and add a cislunar transportation facility to support round-trip Earth-Moon transfers with a long-term support facility on the lunar surface will give them a strategic and technological advantage that will let them dominate space for the next century. If China is willing to declare international waters sovereign territory, how many of you think they won't do the same with cislunar space? America's hopes cannot rest on an incredibly expensive non-reusable rocket, and they can't rest solely on the shoulders of SpaceX and Starship. America should have been using the Falcon Heavy, to throw multi-ton, long-duration, remote-controlled lunar exploration vehicles at the moon as soon as that rocket system was proven. Sending uncrewed, remote-controlled equipment to the moon is not some unproven radical concept. The Soviets were able to do it over a half-century ago. The citizens of free nations will never see Mars if we have to ask permission from China to leave Earth orbit. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. And stay safe at Astro Proterra. Next cue. Vehicle supersonic. Stay separation.